Um, so uh, part of the motivation for the first part of this talk is that when we talk about machine learning, um, it's, it's really um, uh, a, an area of work that uh, needs to be considered in the broader context of uh, several um, key related uh, technologies, processes, and uh, issues. In the context of artificial intelligence as a subset of artificial intelligence, as a key uh, co component of the way data science delivers insight, but not constituting all of data science, and as a tool for helping us make sense of big data. Um, this is a buzzword of confusion, um, a, set of, a set of confusing buzzwords, I'm sure, and alphabet soup. So I'd like to parcel, parcel these out a little bit and to help you understand why health, issue, health disparities and equity issues in machine learning area um, are so important when it comes to some of these cognate domains as well. So artificial intelligence, um, which uh, contains machine learning as a subset, um, uh, consists of the use of computational methods uh, to solve problems that are traditionally viewed as the purview of, na of natural intelligence. Um, and over the years, people um, have increasingly uh, recognized many different subfields within artificial intelligence and many different types of goals. Um, early on, much discussion of artificial intelligence was, was uh, aiming at the general sphere that's now commonly called general intelligence, the capacity to build uh, agents or actors who could translate um, seamlessly from one environment to another, one context to another, undertaking diversity of tasks with at least the facility of a human in terms of uh, the general capacity to learn, to reason, to undertake actions, to observe effects, etc. cetera. Um, in s subsequent decades, um, people recognized that if we were to really conceptualize the challenges there, we can parcel them out into a, a set of activities that are coupled but um, can, be, can be characterized somewhat distinctly. Uh, automated reasoning, planning, understanding of, of human spoken or written language, um, uh, making sense of visual images, um, uh, bringing together multiple lines of, of data. And um, the changing sort of landscape of artificial intelligence meant that increasingly that term was used for these more specialized tasks, leading some pundits to, to comment that AI at any one time is whatever cognitive task hasn't been automated yet, recognizing that many of these things, like handwriting recognition, understanding elements of, langu of spoken language, um, uh, planning, uh, are, are increasingly uh, assisted by automation. Now, machine learning is one subset of artificial intelligence, but it's a particularly key one in the sense that it's used by many others. And therefore, equity concerns within the machine learning area kind of ripple through to many others. We do have equity concerns in other spheres, in the robotic sphere, you know, um, whether self-driving cars can recognize disabled people on the road, uh, someone in a wheelchair, even if they're going in the reverse direction that it was trained to, to reason about. Um, uh, the areas of path planning, uh, routing you on your GPS from one point to another, recognizing spoken language and, and natural language processing, all of these have equity concerns. We don't want to disempower people who may not speak with um, the, the main accent used to train a spoken language recognizer, for example, or have our uh, path planning systematically disadvantage uh, certain areas of a city economically. But all of these actually make central use of, of machine learning. Um, they, they all um, make, make quite heavy use and, uh, such that advances in machine learning or biases in machine learning end up rippling through to issues in these other spheres. If our machine learning algorithms can't generalize um, out of distribution, or even worse, out of sample. Um, they can't generalize sufficiently. We may not recognize that person in a wheelchair in front of the, the speeding autopilot car as um, a pedestrian and someone uh, for whom every level of safety needs to be achieved. 
uh, we won't recognize that the ball contains a child running behind it. So um, in the machine learning sphere, our decisions um, about how to build tools end up having broad ramifications. Now, much of machine learning is designed to, to make use of what um, has widely been termed big data for many years. And this term, uh, like artificial intelligence, um, has meant different things for different people. I'm rather partial to the definition used by, uh, by Google, um, where it defines big data according to the four Vs. It, it's large in volume, that's the big of big data, um, but more notably, it's, it's high in velocity. We have data coming in very, very quickly. So, you know, every 60 seconds, we have nearly 1.5 million um, uh, Facebook um, uh, sort of uh, assessments and, and updates uh, that are seen. We have uh, posts made to YouTube that may shape people's sense of um, the safety of vaccines. Uh, we have information that's shared, for example, via SMS messages or via Snapchat, which may lead people uh, to, towards different knowledge, attitudes, beliefs in the health sphere, may lead to adverse uh, body images, et cetera. So this is high velocity data, and more so than volume, that's been a huge empowerment when it comes to public health. Um, in addition, it's, it's high variety um, from the same data source. Let's suppose a, a smartphone. Um, uh, we might get data on someone's uh, geographic position, um, uh, on their level of physical activity um, as judged through perhaps step counts. We might get uh, information on the type of that physical activity through the accelerometers and, and um, gyroscopes that are involved might have a sense of who's around them from Bluetooth connections, uh, how crowded the area um, is in which they're circulating. Uh, we might uh, look at how much screen time they're getting on this device to assess exposure to online influences. All of these come from a single device, and for a given time and for a given person, we can kind of get a, a broader sense of their context uh, from this device. I chose the example of, of smartphones or wearables, but the same thing holds true, for example, for social media. And you look at people's exposures and contributions there. And finally, um, in a term that's often uh, overused or misused, um, big data can have greater veracity. The issue isn't always that one particular measurement is, is more truthful. Um, it, it, it sometimes is that uh, what we pick up on the phone has, a, has more of a ring of truth uh, in a given measurement than a, a person's self-report, either because self-report is so burdensome. Think about writing down everything you're eating versus snapping a photo of it, for example, um, that we can't get very good data through self-report. Or it may be that uh, the veracity is enhanced because we're dealing with potentially um, matters that people are a bit embarrassed to report about their weight, for example, um, as measured on a, a Bluetooth-enabled weight scale. And what's recorded on the phone might be a little bit more accurate. Their geographic position, uh, another example that might be very burdensome. But often it's a matter of collectively the measurements point to an underlying context with, with greater texture than, than what could be realistically or feasibly uh, and for a, a realistic level of burden achieved by a self-report. Now, in the big data space, a central way we make use of this is machine learning. And so I want to talk about it a little bit more. Um, we talked about the velocity side. Um, and when it comes to health behavior, there's um, many sources of data. Um, the, uh, the data from cell phones, whether it's for mobility or, or pick up aspects of context, um, social media data that I've mentioned but also electronic health records, search queries, um, social media posts, um, lab test results, point of sale data, GIS databases. All of these um, would constitute, um, in many cases, uh, big data. High volume, high velocity, high variety, and, and, and in some cases, high veracity. Why do we care about this in public health? Well, one reason is because uh, this data can um, sometimes indicate um, understanding of a person's context 
or ideation, their knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, for example, that we wouldn't otherwise uh, be able to garner readily. Um, we can pick up understanding of their health exposures or their health behaviors by looking at their mobility data, where they've been at what times, and relating that to pollution levels, relating it to issues concerning um, risks of, of contacting, uh, contacting others. Uh, but one of the big reasons that this, um, this information from these devices or, or these sources can be so important is because it's not only a reflection of the underlying status of a person, um, but it's, it reflects influences upon that person. So we can hardly talk about vaccine hesitancy these days without talking about the role of social media to which they're exposed. Um, it's hard to talk about uh, their, their exposures to COVID-19 risk without talking about their mobility, for example. Um, it's hard to talk about aspects uh, concerning uh, self-harm um, and copycat suicide attempts without speaking about um, the influences that others have via elect electronic mechanisms, the news sources and the wording of that news and the exposure online. So whether it comes to those issues or many more like bullying and aggression and substance use, et cetera, electronic mechanisms give us a clue um, not only to their underlying situation, but what influences uh, they're being exposed to um, that shape, shape them. And you know, increasingly, um, our electronic sphere and interfaces, whether it's a smartphone or wearables or browsers, serve as kind of this conduit um, that, that can capture aspects of our context and, and serves to, to influence us based on what we observe. Okay, so that's big data. And based on the, the challenges dealing with big data, the need to, to uh, efficiently and in a timely fashion um, and insightfully um, manipulate it, um, the whole field of data science was, was born. Um, in many ways, this is driven by the needs for using and handling big data data at levels that transcended what traditional databases could handle, for example. And it's a, broader, um, it's a broader enterprise consisting not just of machine learning, although that's a key component for turning data into insight, but also the, the mechanisms, platforms, processes, principles, and practices for, for drawing insight from this data and making it available quickly. And so it contains many other components uh, technologically geared towards securing rapid and fulsome insight uh, from, from data with machine learning being a key component. There are other components. I do a great deal of work in system science, which interfaces with all these areas. But machine learning has traditionally been the, one of the central ways in which data science seeks to secure insight from data. Um, Okay, so I'd like to go to machine learning. Machine learning um, consists of methods that allow algorithms to automatically learn from and improve performance based on, on data that's observed or experiences that have been undertaken. It's, uh, as I noted earlier, it's heavily used by many areas of artificial intelligence. Um, and it has great implications for public health, both, both directly in terms of machine learning findings and because it influences the, um, the equity and, and the fairness of other AI methods. Um, over the past bunch of decades, indeed since I was first trained in my first machine learning course about 30 years ago, um, machine learning tools, uh, approaches, formalisms have evolved greatly. Um, and we've seen whole generations um, come and, and largely uh, build up. Um, that form our tool sets today. Uh, connectionist methods as well, um, you know, alone, which include neural networks, deep learning, et cetera, have had at least three heydays during my lifetime. One at the end of the 60s with perceptrons, another at the late 80s and early 90s with neural networks. Uh, but where there were barriers identified which really couldn't be overcome at those times and where deep learning, uh, is, is the latest manifestation in a very powerful way of the potential here, overcoming many of those earlier barriers. 
Now, um, this uh, work in machine learning, although it went by different names, pattern recognition, machine intelligence, et cetera, over those decades, it's built up a lexicon um, that is uh, rich enough um, and dense enough to be quite uh, confusing for those coming from other areas. This is particularly true because there are certain terms used in machine learning in a very specialized way, which have very different meanings in other areas. Um, an example uh, is the term bias, which in machine learning is used to refer to a kind of um, offset or intercept um, uh, in, a, in a technical sense. Um, and uh, which is used obviously in the health sphere in a very different sort of way. Regression is used um, as a term within machine learning, but in a much more uh, general way than just traditional regression methods like linear regression, logistic regression, as we'd use them in biostatistics, for example. And um, I'll just leave this with you as a kind of Rosetta Stone for going back and forth where in some cases it's a matter of transliteration, recall being sensitivity, for example. Um, in other cases, it requires um, uh, recognizing that the, the concept is a little bit different, but very close to an, an epi concept. Now, uh, when it comes to machine learning tools that we'll be talking about, um, one of the key uh, factors that shapes what tools we use is, is a question. Um, it's a very basic question. If, if we have data, to what degree for that data do we know a, a correct answer for uh, important subsets of it? Um, for example, if we're dealing with tweets to what do, and we want to classify them as to whether they might, ex they might classify someone who's exhibiting suicidal ideation, um, to what degree have we gone through and manually labeled tweets to, for a subset to indicate this? Um, or to what degree are we just throwing a bunch of tweets at it and we're seeking for it to, to somehow recognize them based on their underlying patterns? Um, if, if we're not dealing with this sort of manual labeling, this, this uh, knowing the correct answer for a subset, we make use of what's called unsupervised learning. There's no teacher saying, you got this wrong. Um, we're trying to recognize patterns in the data without being told what's right and what's wrong. Um, if we have labels for quite a large set, we, we can make use of unsupervised learning, but we have recourse to supervised learning. But if we have just a small number labeled, we might make use of semi-supervised learning or unsupervised learning um, in some cases where that's possible for semi-supervised. Okay, so there's three broad classes of machine learning application that we can talk about. These cut across all these different eras. Kernel methods, statistical learning theory, connectionist methods, Bayesian methods, they each have representatives in these spheres. Description, prediction, not over time, but in, in terms of filling in unknown values, and causal prediction, making use of understanding of or, or um, uh, best, best beliefs about the causal structure of the system. Let's talk about each of these briefly because each will bear on this issue of health disparities. With description, what we're looking for to find in data is hidden patterns of regularity, of orderliness of the data. We may look at data and see something that looks quite random in the fluctuations, but if we look at it with the right lens, say an embedding lens for a time series, we may see, oh, there's actually a, a regular structure here. It may look random, but it's actually not. Um, if we look at it with the right data visualization tool, we may get that, aha, there's all this regularity. I just wasn't seeing it in the columns of data. Um, and uh, we have many tools that can help us with this. Um, descriptive statistics are used here, but data visualization as well. But at a more analytical level, we engage in cluster analysis, um, spatial or in terms of variables. We, we seek to identify latent variables, uh, hidden variables that help explain the variation we do see in, in other variables. 
and we make use of what's called generative approaches that kind of posit some underlying way in which this data is being generated that might have fewer variables. They might have a lot of regularity to it. And there's Bayesian ways of pursuing these, connectionist ways of pursuing these, frequentist ways. Um, but all of these provide a way of trying to explain these patterns in a more orderly fashion. Um, and in some cases, we engage in causality detection. We actually, using machine learning methods, can recognize, for example, to what degree are the, the associations we'll see um, uh, merely an accident of, say, an ecological fallacy, and to what degree are there a reflection of causal driving of the system. Um, these are all tools of machine learning. You could be excused for asking, well, wait a minute, descriptive statistics, that's not machine learning, that's, that's statistics. Well, as we'll see, what distinguishes machine learning is not so much the details of the methods. Um, it does make use of familiar statistics uh, that you'll, you'll, be used, you'll be quite used to. But how it makes use of them, what the goal is, the methodology, for example, using cross-validation is quite different um, than in traditional statistics. We'll come back to this point. So as an example of finding orderliness, we might have millions of tweets and we, we undertake an algorithm that will go classify these tweets automatically, come up with the most salient ways of sort of finding their differences. And we might find that it it sort of characterizes opioid-relating tweets into five different classes based on the words that they use, the sentiments involved, et cetera. Um, and that might help us better make sense of, of uh, this data. Um, in another case, uh, we make use of, of data, for example, from smartphones. This is work uh, that I've uh, been undertaking together with partners in Harvard School of Public Health and the Truth Initiative in the US on uh, using smartphone apps to understand the influences um, that might drive someone's smoking behavior. Uh, a large part of this is looking at messaging, pro-tobacco and anti-tobacco messaging. And we might be looking, for example, uh, in this project, SNAP, um, at ways in which low-income populations are disproportionately messaged with pro-tobacco messaging online and uh, in the context of their day-to-day -day movement. So we map out where people are moving from different backgrounds, uh, and we look at uh, tobacco outlets in their area and visitation to those tobacco outlets based on their locations. We look at the messages they've encountered of various sorts, anti-tobacco messages, pro-tobacco, find clusters. And in, in uh, some of the papers coming out of this, we've made use of machine learning techniques like power law analysis to discover if some of these have disproportionate impacts. Some of the tobacco outlets, for example, are disproportionately accounting for a very large fraction of, of, of purchases or messages that are encountered more than, than others, um, having a disproportionate sway. I won't go into this in, in as much detail um, as a vignette, but uh, it does allow us to look at things like smoking hotspots and their relationship to messaging. Uh, causality detection um, is a key factor here of relevance to health disparities. Distinguishing between mere associational um, um, covariation to, um, to look at what might be driving some of the behaviors, um, some of the ideations we see involving um, uh, self-harm or involving um, uh, in the context of bullying, for example. So description, finding the hidden order in data is one of the big uses uh, we turn to for machine learning. But there's two other uses I'd mentioned. One is prediction. And I mentioned sometimes this is prediction over time, but more commonly it's just prediction of some unknown um, uh, situation or outcome. Uh, the idea here is that we have a set of examples um, where um, we have an example, call it X sub I, and we have a, a, 
a classification of it or a, um, a rating of it, an, an outcome for it that's been measured. Maybe it's just the result of manual scoring, or maybe it's the result of um, uh, a classification by an expert like uh, um, a radiologist who reads uh, MRI. Um, maybe it's uh, the result of knowing how this person actually developed and whether there might have been a subsequent uh, suicide attempt. And uh, the idea is we have this set of examples. They're a small set of all the data we have, but we, have, we know the outcomes for these. And what we're seeking with prediction, whether it's Bayesian prediction or connectionist uh, deep learning prediction or, or prediction with kernel methods or what have you, we're seeking to get a trained function that given any piece of data will tell us fairly reliably what the likely outcome is. For all these ones we didn't score, we didn't tell it the answer, it can fill in what that answer likely is. It'll recognize the underlying patterns that allow it to say, I know what that is, I've seen many examples of that, that's, that's what that is, and classify. That's a sm person smoking right now versus not smoking. Or I know when there's a sign of a coming outbreak, another example where we've applied this. Or I know the signs from accelerometer and geometry uh, and, and um, a gyroscope for when a person is engaged in different types of sedentary and non-sedentary activity. Um, so we make use of techniques. They're called regression if y is continuous, even though they might not look like your traditional logistic or linear or, or generalized linear model regression. Uh, we call them a regression because the outcome is continuous in machine learning. Classification if it's categorical, whether it's nominal, dichotomous, ordinal. Um, and uh, here, you know, a key judgment is training, training the system to recognize. And we make use of a process called cross-validation where we train it on a subset of the data and test it on uh, the remaining data. And then we keep on rotating around in what's called rotation estimation to find a way of classifying that's quite general. It, it's not just beholden to an overfit to the data to which we trained it, but rather reflects the broader patterns we see in the data set. So here we're trying to predict. Um, uh, in many ways, this will remind you of some statistical approaches, but the goals are rather different. Machine learning makes use of, quite heavy use of logistic regression, for example, um, but the goals are different. In statistics, um, often with logistic regression, our interest is in the coefficients. Um, how much um, variation in one of the covariates might explain variation in the, the outcome. With machine learning, Often, and typically, most typically, the interest is in raw prediction. Um, Multicollinearity is a big issue in statistics because we can't tell which covariate it is that's really, really uh, might be driving this outcome because they all covary together. Machine learning, that's really not considered much of an issue because our goal is just raw prediction. If there's collinearity, it doesn't get away from our ability to predict. Um, we might include all those variables in there, uh, or we might scale it back a bit, but we're not really worried about attribution. Um, here, uh, with machine learning, uh, we're training it in a more computationally rich and powerful way, whereas in statistics, uh, often we're, 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 it's what's going on behind the scenes is um, uh, there's uh, simpler computational methods that are more parsimonious computationally, that are more frugal, but they're not as uh, effective for dealing with large numbers of variables, et cetera. Um, now, this sort of work that we do with prediction, though, brings us face-to-face uh, -face with a key issue. And it's an issue that is not unique to machine learning, um, but comes up a lot in the machine learning context, which is if we recognize associations, um, we risk assuming that our data generating process, the, the underlying process that's been generating the data, will remain in the future very similar to how it's been in the past. Um, 
And if we have a counterfactual situation, a new intervention on the public health sphere, um, a new um, uh, therapeutic um, uh, agent um, uh, that's available uh, for use for treatment of patients, um, a new preventive measure like a vaccine, um, it's going to change our, our data patterns. And what we fit so well to before for patterns might no longer be so predictive. Those underlying patterns that we're counting on in our prediction, whether it's through deep learning, whether it's through Bayesian methods, uh, elsewhere in machine learning, or indeed traditional statistics break down and the associations fall apart. The associations now are very different because the data generating process has been changed. Um, and in order to accommodate this, and in order to provide greater explainability and greater out of distribution generalizability, a greater ability for our reasoning to, to translate to very different contexts, a different epidemiological context, et cetera, many of the leading researchers in machine learning, just like some of those in biostatistics, are turning to causal methods. And causal methods seek, um, in many cases, to predict as well. Um, in some cases, they seek to describe, to recognize underlying causal connections. But often, it's predictive. We're interested in having a prediction that causally makes sense. Um, uh, those on the call will recognize from your biostatistics or epi training how um, woefully off base we can be if we assume associations are always indicative of causation, or as the saying goes, if we assume correlation implies causation. Here's a graph of uh, a relationship over time, quite compelling, I would note, between the number of pairs of, of brooding storks, of breeding storks in Germany, uh, and the number of babies um, per year um, that were born in Germany. And you might notice a, a, a striking uh, correlation between them. Um, but needless to say, one would be woefully mistaken um, and would be on a fool's errand if you were to posit that changes in the number of storks are indeed driving the decline in the, the number of babies being born. Um, similar mistakes are made on a routine basis, um, unfortunately, by our um, by our colleagues in the policy sphere, looking at uh, the relationship between population and civil executions, for example, you could be excused, excused for thinking that civil executions um, are much less likely to occur if you have a larger population and, um, and use those to reflect in your, your policy instruments. So correlation does not go along with uh, always with causation. You can have anti-correlation with causation. You can have causation without correlation. And um, those in the epi front have long recognized this. Uh, but there's a generation of machine learning uh, advocates that building on uh, advances in causal learning for statistics, the work of Judea Pearl and others, have built up tools for causal machine learning. And here, we're seeking to, to reason in a way that, as, as I noted, was generalizable against, across context, explainable, and ability, has ability to reason about counterfactuals. Um, traditionally, these methods do rely on some assumptions, some postulated causal structure. So in Judea Pearl's method, we we uh, established what we believe from theory are um, the causal relationships amongst a set of uh, variables. Um, but we can cross check those causal expectations via empirical data and big data can aid in this. We look at conditional independence and reverse dependence as ways of falsifying our causal assumptions, of recognizing when our causal structure that we're assuming just ain't so. It, it, it must have a flaw in it. And uh, within the machine learning space, methods like uh, convergent cross mapping um, can be used to recognize and give you causal hints as to what's driving what 
in a way that is robust, even in the context of, of factors like uh, the uh, ecological fallacy. Um, and uh, you know, these days, uh, if we think about statistical models um, and, uh, and causal models, um, we can put them in the broader context of other types of models as well, such as dynamic models that um, form so much of my professional practice. Uh, and uh, which, which guide our uh, decision makers in the COVID-19 space and other infectious diseases. I will note, um, and as a plug for really exciting work in this area, um, much of which we're involved in, that uh, these sort of mechanistic models, which, which capture um, the structure of a system, can be combined with uh, the sorts of machine learning approaches we've been talking about to, uh, to more effectively learn from data over time, uh, predict forward in, in the context of counterfactuals, et cetera. Um, so in the health disparities context, we've used methods like this, for example, to recognize hidden cases of, of, um, of opioid abuse. Um, in this case, uh, we're dealing with a mixed method study that has a qualitative component. Um, uh, as someone who's a, um, a lead research advisor for our Center on Patient-Oriented Research, I'm a big believer in working with people with lived experience um, in participatory uh, research that brings those um, who are the subject of the data to the table so that we can better understand uh, uh, the texture of their lives, not just what happens to be measured in the data. Uh, and in this case, uh, we're using ground truth record identification via physicians based on presentation records across many settings to automatically try to classify um, uh, individuals as to whether uh, their complaints that bring them to the emergency room, their symptomology, um, the, the issues they're going through um, might be uh, a flag for someone who's struggling with, with opioid, um, uh, opioid use issues um, to identify probable causes. This requires looking beyond uh, classifications by the nurses and doctors using what are called ICD-10 codes, um, but really looking at nurse notes and doctor physician notes and, and full text, for example. Um, and in the health disparities context, we're seeking to use this as a way to better understand what we can offer, for example, take-home naloxone kits, uh, when we can uh, partner with a patient to help uh, guide them to addictions medicine and treatment, and to help them overcome the barriers of stigma that keep many of these individuals away. In other cases, we've used causal methods in the G computation sphere um, to understand the, um, the obesity impacts of interventions undertaken as part of, um, uh, of, of initiatives to reduce inner city obesity within the Los Angeles County area, using data from the California Women, Infants, and Children program, which is, uh, uh, provides uh, low-income individuals with means to support. And we've looked at ways in which different types of interventions um, maybe influencing obesity levels using a causal lens, using something known as G-computation, and I provide a, a reference to it here. It's a tool for causal inference and reasoning that also has somewhat of a micro-simulation feel to it. And based on these things, we can look at likely impacts of different intervention designs on, um, on sort of obesity levels as measured here through the Z-score. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'll, I'll move forward from some of our opioid work because I want to spend some time on talking about the particular barriers here. Um, um, across all machine learning, we're dealing with a set of barriers. Um, one of the big ones is algorithmic bias. It's cases where our, where our algorithms, our machine learning tools running on these large volumes of data systematically build in um, preferences that privilege certain groups, that favor individuals who are perhaps more represented in the data, have better data quality, for example, 
perhaps there are individuals who are who have contributed more data because they're higher income and they have access to more mobile devices. Perhaps they have fewer privacy concerns and as a result uh, than, than a lower income, more vulnerable person. And therefore, um, they, they shift the data in terms of its completeness. Uh, and uh, our algorithms, um, if we're, we're not careful to proceed in, in, a, in a judicious way, might build in this bias towards those who are overrepresented and end up worsening disparities between those w with, uh, with great access to means versus those who are on the low income sign and less represented. Um, uh, privacy is a recurring issue that's particularly keenly felt at the lower runs of socioeconomic spectrum. Um, and, uh, and issues having to do with uh, data quality as well. But I wanna talk specifically about machine learning and big data in terms of, of, of health disparities and some vulnerabilities here. Machine learning um, and big data offer many opportunities in this space that can enrich our understanding of health disparities through better capturing of context, better capturing of the patterns of people's lives for someone juggling several jobs and picking up aspects in a low burden way that, that weigh them down. Um, capturing aspects of exposure across a large city that disproportionately falls on low income individuals and other factors. Um, but there's real vulnerabilities of these techniques um, in terms of um, falling prey to inadvertently um, risking worsening those health disparities. And, and I'd like to cite a few aspects and then talk a little bit um, about uh, uh, some, some particular points related to this um, and ways, ways that we can help uh, lessen these risks. First of all, machine learning approaches by their nature tend to depend heavily on large quantities of data. Some of these approaches like deep learning depend upon very large quantities of data by traditional standards of epidemiology. Hundreds of thousands, millions of records at a minimum. Um, and, uh, and using deep learning approaches um, tunes us um, towards data sets that have that sort of scale. And one of the problems here is that depending on, these, uh, on, on, on that sort of scale of data, inevitably tunes us towards electronic data sets and services where marginalized groups may have less access to them or fear less empowered to participate. Um, um, Twitter, it's a great avenue for monitoring uh, for surve health surveillance, but it, it tends to reflect um, higher income, uh, white collar at least, um, contributions uh, by groups. Um, it tends to downplay groups who are, um, who are on the low side of the socioeconomic spectrum. Um, those wearing wearable devices uh, are predominantly from higher incomes um, and, and they may be the ones providing up this data that's depended on by machine learning algorithms. For these marginalized groups, uh, these sorts of technologies may be inconvenient. Uh, they may not have reliable access to Wi-Fi or a data plan and be hesitant to enroll in studies, um, even like basic income studies, such as we're involved in uh, through our Ethica data commitments. Um, they may be unaffordable. Two members here, high-end smartphones, for example, or wearable devices, Garmin watches, et cetera. Um, there may be privacy concerns that I alluded to that lead to unwillingness of family members to allow others to to carry a device which might provide health insights into the day-to-day -day patterns associated with low-income individuals. Um, uh, and in some cases, there's data quality issues uh, that result from the constraints in these people's lives, inability to, to keep the phone always charged, needing to work with a really old model of the phone that uh, runs out of its battery uh, quickly. 
Um, and uh, we can have enhanced victimization in some cases by theft or aggression. Uh, we've run quite a few studies focused on low-income groups. And one of the things you do see in some of the lowest um, rungs of the socioeconomic spectrum is uh, loss of devices by individuals. Uh, for example, in intravenous, and drug, drug, intravenous drug users, in one study we are running, um, most of the individuals who fell in that category uh, actually suffered a loss of their cell phone. Um, uh, other low-income individuals had, um, had devices stolen, such as their SIM cards. In other cases, devices were impounded by the police. Um, so individuals who are uh, in marginalized groups sometimes don't, don't have their voice reflected in this data nearly as much. Another separate issue is that in machine learning, there's a tendency of data scientists to focus on each data set in isolation, in isolation of context. Um, and sometimes it's to the point of, of treating it as commodity data. This is a big danger because we lose track of the humanity behind that data, what's captured, what's not captured. For whom is it captured, for whom is it not captured? And um, there needs to be better attention uh, to those matters, which tends not to be the training of, of data, of, of most those trained in data science. Um, and finally, and very importantly, when we train these machine learning algorithms, when we judge how successful a prediction algorithm is, for classifying smokers from non-smokers, or for uh, identifying an individual suffering from major depressive disorder based on Facebook posts. Um, within machine learning, traditionally, we look at overall performance of the algorithm. We judge it by its um, ability, if it's a classification, its area under the curve, the ROC curve, the, re uh, the receiver operating characteristic or uh, we'll assess it according to goodness of fit to the data via other measures. But it's that overall performance rather than its performance with respect to certain outliers or certain at-risk individuals. And we may um, impoverish our ability to recognize um, the needs of those outliers by just having it um, best address the needs of the most common. Um, so a few anti-patterns in this area. Um, patterns which, when we undertake them, really risk uh, under, undermining the effectiveness of our study for, for informing understanding of health disparities and, and for undercutting those health disparities. If we focus in our interventions only on groups carrying digital devices or using digital services, um, that can disempower individuals who don't happen to have those devices. These days, smartphones, um, compared to when we started this work with smartphones in 2011, um, or other mobile devices uh, well before that, you know, uh, those were more specialized devices for higher income individuals. These days, smartphones are widely carried, but there are more specialized devices like Fitbits, for example, that are, um, that are not as widespread in low income uh, groups still. If we de-emphasize those who opt out due to privacy concerns, we risk um, underinvesting in analyses that could help us understand their particular vulnerabilities. Their silence censored from the data set via our techniques. And often in machine learning, we toss away outliers in a kind of formulaic way, in a way that, that blinds us to their special needs. Um, if we take interventions that are machine learning informed, but we only undertake them via digital devices and services, once again, we threaten enhancing the digital divide, the, the divide between the haves and have nots with respect to health, um, because we're favoring those who have the devices that allow them to take advantage of it. Um, another thing you hear in machine learning that I think is a somewhat dangerous notion is, you know, uh, we have massive data and it doesn't matter if it's data, lots and lots of data on a small population or a smaller bite of data on a massive population. There's a big difference. 
the diversity of the population is extraordinarily important for equity concerns. And it's not the same to have massive longitudinal data on just a few people, um, because that can impoverish our understanding of these, um, of these divides. Um, there are other risks as well that are more specialized. For example, if we're working among at-risk groups like children or the elderly, um, there's particular risks there, um, increasing screen time among children, for example. Some of these are issues with machine learning. Some are issues with the big data that goes into machine learning. But they often come together with uh, studies to make use of machine learning because it's so focused on, on, um, on areas of uh, making use of, of big data. Um, so what are some benefits of machine learning? I've, I've warned about so many risks. With some of those risks still being present for traditional biostatistics as well. Well, I do believe there's many reasons for hope. And I'll, I'll get to some suggestions for advancing us. But um, some benefits here is we really can capture greater context with some of these devices. We can capture greater richness of uh, a person's exposures, a person's surrounds. In, in critical realist uh, thinking, we talk about the importance of context, mechanism, and outcome. And uh, we need to be able to capture that context better than we can with traditional measures and reason about it better. Machine learning provides formidable ways of doing that. We can have less rigid assumptions about the relationships between variables. We can find through deep learning um, highly nonlinear, non-obvious relationships we wouldn't have expected. And we can learn about these hidden patterns in massive quantities of data. We can identify causally driving relationships with enough data that otherwise would have merely seemed to us as potentially being a matter of association. We, we really can't know. Um, and that's important for knowing how we can change things for the better. If we have, understand a causal point of relationship, we can potentially, by changing one, change the results um, in a counterfactual way. Um, tools like this uh, have a, uh, a capacity to capture additional forms of knowledge, uh, full text, for example, spoken language, which can be empowering for individuals uh, absent literacy, for example. Um, and uh, we can do so at a scale that, you know, is hard to imagine with traditional tools. And we can keep up, pick up relationships between individuals and, and variables that aren't captured with traditional uh, data collection mechanism. And we can use these things to build theory. How do we, so how do we uh, cross between this uh, scylla of, of, uh, where machine learning is a profound danger in this uh, Charybdis where we give, um, uh, we only emphasize older techniques and we eschew machine learning altogether. Well, I think a few key principles will help. And I'm grateful to colleagues over the years for helping emphasize these. One is the principle as the UN, um, uh, the UN had articulated, none of us are safe until all of us are safe. We have to ensure that our machine learning aims at empowering all, not just the average, not just uh, uh, performance for those highly represented in the data set. Um, no, the principle of no AI about us, without us, of involvement by underrepresented groups. Um, if we have data about a group, we'll do so much better in undertaking machine learning study of that data if we can speak with those who are part of that group about interpretation of the data, understand the patterns that we may be seeing better, and give them a human face. We need to recognize, and this is not part of traditional technical education and machine learning, that algorithms are not neutral. They can build in biases. They can build in unfair advantages. And we need to, uh, just as much as we need to tune our algorithms to achieve best performance in classification, we need to tune our algorithms to, um, to better empower uh, those uh, all throughout society 
and not those who are already privileged. And we need to recognize the data is not neutral as well, and that certain variables that we measure may be downplaying the significance of just as important variables we can't measure. Um, and uh, as Marshall McLuhan said, uh, uh, sort of paraphrasing Winston Churchill from an earlier generation, we shape our tools and our tools shape us. We need to make sure that by adopting AI tools, we don't, um, uh, we don't under treat data as a commodity uh, rather than as an expression of the human experience. Um, you know, I think uh, striving to understand the texture and context of the setting from which data is gathered is key. And principles of accountability, um, that uh, when you give recommendations from the data, there should be some accountability from there. Transparency in the processes, what assumptions are being made and when and, and in what way. Respect for the parties and dignity, um, key from an ethics perspective. Maintaining an interdisciplinary ecosystem and increasingly, I hope, transdisciplinary, the process of active learning, um, learning over time from experience, where our algorithms went off base, where they disempowered groups, and striving to learn from that and do better. And, val and finally, as someone who, who is a big practitioner of not just data science, but system science, the science of the whole, I believe there's a real key need here for a system science lens that looks beyond the pieces and sees how they come together to form the whole, looks beyond uh, looking through straws at particular pieces at a system and seeks to knit them together into a broader understanding. Health uh, equity impact assessments, um, advancing techniques in a way that lessen vulnerability to bias, and there's a set of machine learning methods that aspire to do exactly that. Causal methods, uh, adversarial networks, variational autoencoders. I know these are buzzwords um, that you, you might or might not have encountered before, but these are cutting edge tools that can help us move to a way that our, our algorithms are less beholden to, to biases. Um, training teams and, and team science um, is key and providing those conducting the data an end-to-end -end experience from data um, collection and daily life to see what that data captures and what it doesn't is key. So a few uh, take-home points and we can open it for discussion. So machine learning methods are, are, are a collection of approaches that allow algorithms to automatically learn from and, and improve performance based on new data or experiences. The experiences refers to reinforcement learning, for example. Um, Equity considerations in machine learning area, huge implications across AI and implications for equity and health disparities more broadly. The need to secure insight from big data is a key driver for enabler and machine learning methods. And often the use of machine learning kind of goes along with um, larger sources of data. So the two often are fellow travelers. Um, health big data, uh, not only provides a, a really valuable source for, for insight, but can actually uh, be a necessity for understanding the influences on individuals uh, in, some in, in some context. And we have to make sure it doesn't underplay those in, in marginal groups. I had talked about the three big uses of machine learning, describing, finding hidden structure, predicting, filling in the gaps of our knowledge uh, based on on generalizing from patterns that we have seen and, 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 and capturing the, the missing understanding for those that we haven't, and predicting in a way that reflects the causal structure. Causal machine learning supports counterfactual reasoning, generalizability and explainability in a very powerful way. And you know, used in the right way, big data machine learning can lend understanding of health disparities but used in the wrong way, it can deepen them. And uh, a central principle here is to work with those whose data is represented, those with lived experience, those from the communities being studied to ensure that their voice, their broader um, understanding of the context that part of it is captured in the data is represented at the table. Um, and you know, uh, we will strive um, 
to understand context, avoid commoditization of, dang, of data, uh, avoiding just throwing out outliers and adopting a systems approach. If we, if we aspire to those goals, we can go a long way to, to helping enable the potential, realizing the potential of machine learning um, while uh, avoiding falling prey to some of the risks of it dehumanizing those who are captured within it um, uh, imperfectly.